will indeed now make a make a start. Good. Well, good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to what promises to be a, a wonderfully interesting and colourful account of family history, a very personal one, obviously. Um, let me just say for those of you whose names I don't recognise, who may not be familiar with the Insiders Outsiders project, um, you can see my name on screen, Monica Bomduchin. It started off with a very small idea, which got rapidly very big, to celebrate the contribution of those who found sanctuary here from Nazi-dominated Europe to this country's culture. And no, I can't hear. The, is there a problem with the volume, with the audio? No? I'm fine. I can hear there's some, you. There's somebody called Rosie. Hold on. I, 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 right. I think I, I'm just muting somebody who's not, not muted. Um, where was I? Yeah, so it started off as a year-long nationwide arts festival precisely on that topic that ran from March 2019 to March 2020. It already included as part of a very wide-ranging program of events across all media, venues big and small and somewhere in between, interventions, if you like, by members of the so-called second generation, those who, like myself, like Fanny, in large measure, have inherited our family histories and have sought to make sense of them to do something perhaps creative with them, which Fanny has certainly been doing. Um, and then, of course, COVID struck, and like everybody else, we decided the only way to continue, and I was determined to continue, was to go online. And as some of you may be aware, I do notice some familiar faces and names on screen. Um, it's an ongoing programme of mostly now <clears throat> online events on all manner of topics, both directly and indirectly connected with that remarkable generation and its, and its legacy. Um, there are now more and more face-to-face -face ones, and I may mention uh, one or two of them later if I, if I have time, but um, do take a look. If you're not familiar with the Insiders Outsiders festival.org website, take a look and see what else is in store. But let's now focus on the matter in hand. There's, sorry, I just let in a latecomer here. So funny story sort of fits the remit of the festival in certain important ways, but it is in fact, I think a more complicated, well, all stories are complicated, but it actually has many different threads to it, doesn't it, Fanny? And you know, I look forward very much <coughs> to hearing you talk about them, but there are connections as all of you will soon discover. Uh, it's a story as she puts it, well, in fact, the title of her <coughs> not yet published manuscript tells it all in the sense, airbrushed, a family lost and found again. And in the uh, material that you sent me, Fanny, I was very struck by a particular phrase that you used. You talked about throughout your childhood, your parents guarded their past with the ferocity of Cerberus, which is <laughs> a, vivid, a vivid way of, of putting yes. it. And it's been your task to excavate, to, to, yes, to, to, to find out more and what an extraordinary story it is. Let me though, before handing over to Fanny, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm suddenly really croaky, <laughs> tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she grew up in Hampstead, and Hampstead is in a sense very much at the heart of this story that you're about to hear, a stone's throw from the wonderful Heath, um, Sir Heath, educated locally and then at North London Collegiate before attending Oxford uh, in the 1980s. Her first career was actually um, as um, in the exhibitions department at the v and a and you curated by the sound of it some interesting exhibitions there. Uh, you moved, or rather I should say that she moved to, uh, to Devon uh, with her husband, who's been very helpful on the tech side, by the way, thank you, Charles. <laughs> um, and she's raised three children and joined the theatre scene, uh, working with an eminent local director to write, produce and platform and perform, sorry, in community plays, which examine themes of exclusion, colonization and isolation in the rural community through a historical lens, her own words. She's currently working on a new play and I for one very much look forward to hearing more. So without further ado, let me with great pleasure hand over to Fanny Mills. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, and welcome everybody. Um, I'll just launch straight in. Um, when my husband, Charles, and I made a somewhat random decision to move to the wilds of North Devon, my status as an outsider, having spent most of my life in London, was glaringly obvious. There was a joke circulating at the time that when Charles said to me, we're moving to the countryside, I thought he meant Highgate. I felt pretty alienated in my new setting and my response was to sit down and write a play about it. I shone my outsider light onto the world of Devon families. Too closely tied to one another and to the land with all of the resulting tragic comedy. 
But in a way, this insider outsider feeling has been with me all my life. And when during lockdown, I decided to sit down and write the story of my own family, I began to understand that I had walked that line as long as I can remember. So I hope this can truly be classified as an insider's outsider's story. It is a story of refugees versus aristocrats, rebellion versus conformity, life, and the way the people at the heart of it managed all of these contradictions. It began with my Hampstead childhood. And some of you in this audience will know that a Hampstead childhood is a very particular thing, different from any other, with a sort of staginess about it. It's a place full of people dislodged from their backgrounds and trying to efface their roots. My family was intensely, almost comically nuclear. There was mum, dad, my two brothers, me, and the golden retriever. That was it. Other people had grannies and grandpas, aunties and uncles, or cousins. We didn't. We lived halfway down Downshire Hill, one of the loveliest streets in Hampton, at number 38A, which you can see here. Fun, it was funny, a mock Tudor funny. house, set back a bit. Oh. Have I, have I frozen? Yes, Fanny, I'm sorry to interrupt. I do apologise, but actually you're freezing rather too often for comfort. Can I suggest okay. you do, no, you do what you suggested. Turn your video off. Carry on screen sharing. Turn your okay. video off and let's see if that helps. I do apologise. Let's try that for a bit. We can, blame, we can blame the depths of Devon, I'm afraid, for the IT issues. Let's hope it, uh, it helps. Yes, absolutely. Is that better? Uh, okay. Yes, but you need to start so, screen sharing again. Okay, so we screen. Yes, that's that's. Can good. you see that? Yep, that's fine. So here we are. Here's 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 our house in Hampstead. Um, it was a mock Tudor house, set back a bit, and contrasting with the smart Georgian terraces, either side. Here, my parents created an idyllic life devoted to art, literature, science, and thought. Long, happy evenings were spent on the terrace at the back of the house, with the warmth emanating from the stones, the scent of jasmine filling the air, and it all seemed safe, happy, and unchanging. At the heart of this idyll was mother, Laura. Here she is. She was an art school graduate, five foot seven. She had hazel eyes, chestnut brown hair, usually drawn up into a high ponytail, 60s style. She was so endlessly well, just present. She could usually be found in the kitchen or in the garden or on Hampstead Heath, filling up sketchbooks. Sometimes with charcoal, soft pencils or gouache, she had a deep frown line between her eyebrows, which would deepen as she sucked the point of her sable brush and squinted at her subject. Now, the other thing we knew about my mother was that she was posh. Posh because she had a coots checkbook and posh because there was a list of words we weren't allowed to say. Pardon, toilet, settee, perfume, pleased to meet you and a whole string of other words. And once when a friend of my brother's rang up and said, can I speak to Tony, please? She replied, there's no Tanya here. My dad, Tony, was a different kettle of fish altogether. He was tall, enormously brainy, charismatic and thin skinned. With black framed glasses that were so much a part of his face that when he took them off, he looked sort of undressed somehow. There was a deep rut across his nose and his eyelids were studded with fascinating little balls of skin. His lair was in the front downstairs room, one side of which was an enormous Tudor style bow window. I can remember his roll top desk full of tiny little drawers and cubby holes. 
which house tiny little screwdrivers for fountain pens and tipex. Lots, lots of tipex. His days were spent clad in his fisherman's jumper, crushed over his electric typewriter, furiously typing out his books on the history of science, or of his great hero, Charles Babbage. You never went anywhere near his office while he was working, as he could be terrifying. When he emerged from his room, Dad would often be muttering furiously, sometimes having full-blown shouted conversations with himself. My brothers and I were so used to this that we had devised a special code for trying to alert him if he was doing it in public. He was an avowed communist to begin with, veteran of the Aldermaston marches, and raising us on various publications of the Left Book Club. My parents could not have been more different from one another, but they were certainly very happy together. They were a familiar sight on the streets of Hampstead, sometimes walking down to South End Green to catch the number 24 bus, or heading up the high street to the Everyman Cinema to see Les Enfants du Paradis for the umpteenth time. We lived by a, supreme, a supremely confident set of cultural orthodoxies and the yellow carpeted sitting room at the back of the house was crammed with books on every conceivable subject. The Bible was Dr. Spock's manual of childcare and one wall of our kitchen was designated for us to draw on in order to encourage our powers of self-expression. But behind our modern free-thinking middle-class lifestyle, there were certain impenetrable silences, no-go areas which we stumbled upon every now and again, and which prompted a reaction either or you simply could not get them to talk about family. Not once during my childhood did my mother mention either her own mother, I don't think I can ever remember her saying the word mum or mummy, nor did she mention any possible siblings. It was as if I didn't have a grandmother and that my mother had been divinely created. Occasionally we heard about her father, usually from my dad who used to say, he really saved your mother. Saved her from what, we all wondered. But looking back on things, there were a few clues. One clue was a huge Navy issue fawn duffel coat hanging in the wood panelled hallway, which seemed to be imbued with some certain significance from the past, as if a ghost lived somewhere inside its rough fabric. Then there was a portrait. This was of my grandmother and my namesake, Fanny, a beautiful and sad pastel portrait. I always felt proud of my Russian Jewish grandmother, although she died before I was born. And at times thinking about her seemed to make my dad sad. Then there was a book, which was very embarrassing on the subject of sex, which slid off the shelves every now and again, this was Ways of Seeing by fashionable TV art historian, John Berger. We looked at it guiltily every now and again, but we had no idea of any special significance. Then there was this portrait, which hung in Kenwood House, we visited, which we visited literally every week of my childhood. I was entranced by her as she seemed to contain such vitality. And how pleasing to be told that she was my ancestor, the great 18th century comic actress, Mrs. Jordan, here as Viola in Twelfth Night. Another clue, had I known about it, was that every day there was an elderly woman with a deep voice and a pronounced limp who paced the streets of Hampstead following people who looked like my mother and suffering from terrible disappointment whenever they turned around and went Laura after all. But of course, as children, we only thought sporadically about these mysteries. We were usually just getting on with our daily lives. 
Our perfect Arcadia continued until we became teenagers. And then, as teenagers do, we started to kick against it, searching for a deeper sense of identity. But still our parents revealed nothing about family. And it took the death of my mother very suddenly and much too young in 1999 for any kind of understanding to dawn. In the aftermath of her death, brothers, sisters, cousins, uncles and aunts, who I never knew existed, started coming out of the woodwork. The first person to shake off the dust and step into the light was my maternal grandmother. It turned out that my mother did have a mother and her name was Rosemary. And although she had died a long time ago, she had been alive and well until I was eight years old. It was strange, I recognised little details of myself in her. She always wore trousers and she hated having her photograph taken. I dreamt about her, she was trying to tell me something, but I couldn't quite hear the words. Rosemary, my grandmother, was a person born into the most aristocratic setting you could possibly imagine. She had a massively rich and grand parents, Lord and Lady Wimborne. Here they are in Dublin, where Lord Wimborne was Lord Lieutenant. Their house was next door to the Ritz, and the story goes that when the Ritz asked Lord Wimborne if they could buy his house to make it into a hotel, he replied, well, I was rather thinking of buying your hotel and making it into a house. Lady Wimborne, known as Mimi, was incredibly glamorous, sexy and flirtatious. Men were always falling in love with her. Here she is, photographed by Cecil Beaton. But there was about Mimi something of the fairy tale wicked queen. She was so vain that she couldn't bear to have her teenage daughters around her. So she banished her daughters, Rosemary and Cynthia, to a cottage in the village with their governess, where they saw nobody their own age. Rosemary, seen here on the left with plaits, immersed herself in reading, learning yards and yards of poetry by heart, and she began to withdraw into a world of her imagination. Meanwhile, Mimi conducted a series of affairs with younger men, including a very long one with composer William Walton, who was really the love of her life. And perhaps unsurprisingly, Mimi married her daughter Rosemary off to the first eligible suitor who came along. This turned out to be Gilbert Hay, and he was brother of this man on the right, who you will be familiar with if you've seen the film White Mischief. He was the soon to be murdered Earl of Errol, known as Wicked Uncle Joss. The Hay brothers were direct descendants of Mrs. Jordan, whose portrait at Kenwood House had so entranced me. Rosemary's Gilbert was a very charming and kind man and the more wicked his brother got, the more honourable he became. But it was perhaps inevitable, given her cloistered childhood, steeped in reading and religion, that a creature as intense as, as Rosemary was not going to be confined. Her rich imaginative life was the only thing that had been allowed to develop, and it demanded expression. An explosion was bound to happen. So, in 1950, she published a novel about a woman breaking out of her narrow background with the title A Hill Called Error. This was taken from The Pilgrim's Progress, one of her favourite books. Then she was introduced by her son, Alistair, who, he was the mystery owner of the fawn duffel coat, to an intense young Jewish Within months, Rosemary had started an affair. The artist was John Berger, dubbed by my newly met Uncle Robin, Serial Shagger, and author of that embarrassing book about sex on our shelves. Rosemary hammered out page after breathless page in her diary. I've never known anyone with so dazzling a presence, she wrote. 
Rosemary hurtled along her new path. It was a clenched fist to her stifling milieu, a real life Marxist and a young and devastatingly attractive one who seemed to be deeply in love with her. And for Rosemary, love was the thing. She had an overwhelming and desperate urge for the sort of deep romantic love that she felt she had never experienced. During her unnatural teen years, this yearning had taken deep root. She saw love as her escape, the ultimate fulfillment which she searched for with the reverence of the quest for the Holy Grail. And at last she seemed to have found it. As for Berger, he confessed later that the wellspring of his attraction for Rosemary was to the well-born rebel, always the aristocrat, however extreme the rebellion. So divorce from Gilbert followed and confession to her children who were disturbed and not too happy about the turn of events. Then finally obliterating all connection with her former life, she bought a solid stone house in faraway Forest of Dean, christened the Dark House. A year or so later, my grandmother and John Berger were married in a registry office in Hampstead. All went well to start with in the dark house. The house filled up with John's communist friends. So that's Renato Gutoso, the guy with the cigarette, communist painter P Peter Perry, a slim and intense Jewish emigre artist, and Peter de Frencher, a left-wing intellectual artist. Everyone would gather in the main sitting room with its pink carpet, its aubergine colored doors, to listen to music on a wind up gramophone with a large horn. The children looked on with bemused skepticism at this new life their mother had created and found that there were not many laughs. But Rosemary quickly found her new life contained some uncomfortable truths. She did not like the reality of John's communism finding it hysterical and slightly mad. She was not really interested in politics herself. And she did not like the way he projected his moods onto her. She also found her own creative life was expected to take second place to John's. Berger gave up being an artist to embark on his first novel. And although she was the one who was the published novelist, Rosemary became handmaiden to his enterprise. Berger's novel, A Painter of Our Time, is really an exploration of his own personal crisis against the backdrop of the crisis of communism in Hungary in 1956. But for me, the painful thing about it is to realize that he created for his protagonist an upper-class English wife called Diana, but nicknamed Rosie. This is undoubtedly a version of my grandmother. And his description of this character become less and less complimentary as the novel and the marriage progressed. During the last few days, said the protagonist, I have quarreled with Diana on every possible occasion. The whole place is heavy with disappointment, like gas from a leaking pipe. Berger was increasingly absent and clearly being unfaithful. And Rosemary grappled with every aspect of her marriage in her diaries, trying to understand why it was all going wrong. Her fairy tale was beginning to crash painfully into reality. Her pride was wounded and she knew that the fulfillment of her deep yearning for love lay in ruins about her. Her marriage to John came to an end in 1958, and she was never quite the same again. Having cut herself off so entirely from her former life, she found herself alone. And afterwards, Berger never referred to her again. In the pages and pages of print about him, TV personality, man of his times, Rosemary is passed over again and again. She is not mentioned once. 
her own artistic life set at nothing and her marriage to John denied. But let us leave Rosemary for a moment and turn now to another woman, a woman of the same generation who struggled to break out of her background and the path life had laid out for her. This is my other grandmother, Fanny. The beautiful, brilliant Russian Jewish lady of the pastel portrait. She was born in 1896 to a Lithuanian Jewish family who emigrated and ended up in Manchester where they established themselves as tailors. Fanny was a young woman of destiny. Look at this family photograph. Her sisters are grouped around their mother, happy to be described on the census as assistant tailoresses. Fanny is seated separately, looking out into the future and firmly describing herself as a student. She became a pioneering female history student at Manchester University and then went on to write a master's, her thesis being called Trading Posts in Africa. In other words, her horizons were very wide and she had big ideas. She married someone who also had big ambitions and who seemed to be just the person to help develop her ambitions, Alexander Hyman. He himself came from a very well-established family of rabbis from Schlutz, but he spurned rabbinical training to become an early director of Shell Oil. He was determined to succeed as a kind of plutocrat with artistic leanings and a member of the establishment. He traveled around in a chauffeur driven Rolls Royce and walked us forward while collecting rare books and pictures in his spare time. Honey and Alexander had the world at their feet. They were part of a new business elite around Shell Oil, fully aware of the need for assimilation into British life, but also well connected through friends and family in Zionist circles. He knew everybody. Fanny, shop, Fanny shopped at Harvey Nichols and they saw every production of importance at the ballet, the opera and the theatre. And they travelled the world together, going on cruises that were part business and part pleasure. Here she is in Havana with someone called Polyakov. And here she is at the best hotel in Cape Town, looking very stylish. And this was her favourite hotel, the Cappuccini Convento in Amalfi. Fanny was always the centre of attention. She had a new haute couture dress every day and she cho chose between her 38 pairs of Ferragamo shoes, revealing a subtle glimpse of diamonds and emeralds. She had her portrait painted by well-established portrait painter Emmanuel Levy. She was, as my new cousin Francis said admiringly, to the manner born. She was just regal, he said. And I could feel the power of her influence on him all these decades later. Fanny and Alexander, in other words, were a great success. But sadly, something went wrong for Fanny. The first hint of trouble came in 1924 when her second child died shortly after birth, which upset her very deeply. She recovered well and went on to have another child in 1928. So now she had a daughter and a son into whom she channeled much of her sense of needing an achievement of her own. And then during the war, it was decided that she should go with their son to Canada for their safety. Fanny found that her son was difficult and she wrote a letter home describing him as a little Hitler. Her mental health collapsed and out there in the snowy wilds of Canada she made her first suicide attempt. Somehow Fanny found herself the wrong side of the fragile barrier between her destiny as a woman of extraordinary talent, beauty and ambition and a murkier world of not quite being a full part of British society. She began to feel like someone who had been passed over and was shut away, not part of things. 
This feeling was made sharper because other people were playing a full part in the drama of the mid 20th century. Her daughter, Margaret, for example, was living a very exciting life. She was posted during the war to North Africa to work with Richard Crossman, head of wartime, wartime propaganda. And her son, my dad, became a communist, which she deeply disapproved of. And she became a great devotee of the religious philosopher Simone Weil. But she herself was not living the life that Weil did. Weil volunteered for the Spanish, Spanish Civil War and then joined the French resistance to the Nazis. By contrast, Fanny and Alexander's war effort was to smuggle a pastry chef called Mitzi out of Vienna so she could make their son apple strudel. At about the same time that Rosemary was having her crisis and breakup with John Berger, Fanny was reading Anna Karenina, her favorite novel. Then one day she made the short walk to Richmond station and there she threw herself under a train. And so I started to understand that in the few years before I was born, my parents, young people in London, who had been together for about four years, were facing a major trauma. They had to find a way of coping with both of their mothers in terminal crisis. The choice they made was to make a clean break to create a brand new world of their own, their very own fresh approach to the insiders outsiders conundrum. Tony and Laura reacted very strongly to their mother's crises. First of all, Tony cut out the pictures of his father from the family album, as you can see here. He removed every single picture of his own father, blaming him for his mother's suicide. And then he made Laura choose between himself and her family. So they got married, they left for Israel, where they left, lived for a year, starting their brand new middle-class life. And on the way back, they stopped in Amalfi, staying at the Cappuccini Convento, Fanny's favorite hotel. Here's my dad sunning himself. And then they went to Caradell in Scotland, intending to start a new life. So far, so understandable. But then my parents made a most inexplicable decision. They decided to move to Hampstead, slap bang in the middle of the complex drama of both their families. And all of the people they had vowed never to speak to again. So they moved here to Dunstan Hill. This is where my dad lived when he was growing up in Finchley. Here is where my dad's sister lived, 18B Belsize Park Gardens after the war. This is where Rosemary married John Berger in the Hampstead Registry Office. And here, my mum's little brother and sister lived in Nutley Terrace. And here, her big brother Alistair lived in the so-called Ménage à Trois with Kingsley Amis and his wife. And my cousin Francis lived in Glenmore Road here, all within a tiny, tiny area. So every single time my parents stepped out of their front door, every walk up Hampstead High Street or onto the heath, was I said that Hampstead was a stage. And on that stage, my parents created a farce. They must have been on constant alert. How stressful must it have been for my mother? keeping her eyes to the ground, lurking in porches, letting herself back into the sanctuary of number 38A with a sigh of relief. And the farce tipped over into tragedy when it came to Rosemary. Because Rosemary was lonely and living a mere 15 minutes walk away was her beloved daughter, Lawley and her family of three children, none of whom she was allowed to meet. 
She was the lady with the limp who used to follow people thinking they were Laura. And in her light and airy flat in Swiss Cottage, people remarked that Rosemary seemed very fond of the little sculpture of a girl playing a guitar. It clearly meant a lot to her. This was the figure of Laura by her art school boyfriend, Seth Cardew. Rosemary poured her love into a bronze figure of her daughter, while the living, breathing Laura was just a stone's throw away. Why? You may very well ask the question, why? And certainly my parents were lost in some kind of insiders, outsiders limbo. Wanting to be at the center of things, but not able to be yet, also not pro properly able to let go and start a new life. This seems to me the very definition of purgatory. And why? Perhaps because the only way my father could keep going psychologically after his mother's suicide was to create a sort of fiction in his mind. It was his father's fault or his sister's. People were against him. And the move to Hampstead bringing him into everyday contact with the players was necessary to keep his fiction well stoked. My father was a wonderful man, extraordinary in so many ways, but he allowed himself to go down the route of conspiracy. He loved Burgess, Philby and Maclean. He strode around the streets of Hampstead, seeing spies everywhere and fulminating against his father. And of course, ripe matter for his mighty brain could be found in Laura's family. Were they whispering in corners, hatching their plots, turning people against him? Much later, when he was dying, after years of not really speaking, suddenly we began to talk. He kept wanting to buy me pastries, remembering the delicious cooking of Mitzi, the pastry chef, whom his mother had rescued from Austria in the 1930s. He said to me that he should have been more forgiving in his life. And he said that as the grandson of Rabbi Hyman, rabbinical scholar, kosher butcher, center of the Jewish community in Whitechapel, surely he deserved a visit. In other words, he had in fact begun his own process of dismantling his fiction. My father's funeral was held somewhat improbably in an Anglican church, well stocked with copies of his self-published book called The Self-Seeker. Personally, I can't read it, but there are those who have, and they tell me it is an attempt to explain consciousness through the conception of the way of truth and the way of seeming, as formulated by Greek philosopher Parmenides. In his book, he examines subjectivity and objectivity, inside and outside of yourself, the inside of you and the outside of you. If you bravely get to the end of his book, you will probably find that he decided the truth lay somewhere in the middle. Thank you. Thank you. Ever so much, Fanny. That was beautifully uh, expressed and presented. Um, lovely. So you can wait. Let me see if I can start video. Doesn't it? That's fine. I'm going. Hi. To... Hi. Good. <laughs> Good. Lovely. Apologies, everybody, for the minor blips. It actually wasn't too bad. There were sort of a few moments when I tried not to panic, but it was actually fine in the end. I think. So. I'm sorry. I hope you could no, hear no, me. No, absolutely yeah. fine. Fine. Good. So um, I haven't done my usual thing, and that is to sort of type into the chat, ask your questions now. But, you know, we're a fairly small and I think quite intimate group. I suspect, you know, some of the uh, people attending. I certainly know some of them, too. So I think perhaps we can do it quite informally if people would like to ask or comment on anything that Fanny has <coughs> said in the last hour or so. Um, please, you know, put up your hand. Um, if you want to just type something in, you're also very welcome to. I'm sure you know the ropes in the chat function, but I think we could perhaps make it more lively and interactive if people actually ask the questions yes. and the comments them, them, themselves. Um, gosh, you couldn't make it up, could you? I mean, what an <laughs> Yes, I mean, <laughs> you seem absolutely fascinating. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
unless I missed it at the beginning when I was worrying about technicalities, you didn't actually say how this all began to unfold. You know, I've read your wonderful manuscript and, you know, it starts with a very particular occurrence. And I don't think, or did, uh, did I miss it, that you actually explained how it all... Uh, the letter, yeah. yes. Yeah. No, I, I slightly um, uh, didn't want to complicate matters with too many different people, because I know when one's talking about family, Sometimes, you know, I know the personalities, but if you don't, it can get really confusing. Um, but yes, no, it all started off with um, a letter which came completely out of the blue from someone who said they were my mother's brother. And of course, I had no idea that this guy even existed. Um, and it was a very nice letter, it was a charming letter, but it said he was sad to hear his sister had died. Ah, now you've wanted to know if there was somewhere where scattered, could he go and see them? And um, actually it was my husband who suggested I should ring him up. So I, I picked up the phone and called him and we just had a lovely, lovely chat. Um, and it all seemed very natural. And he said, I expect you're breaking ranks by ringing me. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry, but I've never heard of you. <laughs> And so that was how it began. And that was how the, the sort of, you know, the sort of lid that had been kept down on everything was suddenly lifted. And, and all, all of these revelations um, came out of the woodwork. Am I right in suspecting, I know you mentioned that your father started talking towards the end of his life, but that actually, yeah. like I think many people of our sort of generation, that it was actually only when the parent was no more that you felt somehow able to pursue and yes and no you're absolutely right. You're so right because I think I mean I think he, he had got this thing in his mind that he had to keep control of the story that and I think it exercised a, a, a terrible sort of psychological burden on him and then I think you know, in, in his last few months, he just sort of let go of all that uh, and just wanted to talk freely. I, and I think that's quite a common thing to happen. And um, and so, yes, he suddenly did just start ruminating on things and, and, and saying, I wish I'd been more forgiving and all this kind of thing. And it, and it was terribly intense, um, but also rather lovely because I felt that he, he had come to some kind of uh well to closure to use the modern jargon himself and and he'd let go of it he'd let go of it all and so i was really pleased and delighted also just kind of flipping the coin in a sense you've mentioned your siblings and i noticed is it lorna is, is lorna your your sister for her? There. yes i can't <laughs> see you <'cause> hi lorna <laughs> she's there um am i right also in suspecting that you are the one who have kind of carry the torch is perhaps not quite the right word, but you know, you're the one who's been intent on finding out more, perhaps more than your, your sister. Yeah, no, it did tend to fall, <clears throat> fall to me. Um, I think, uh, yes, I don't know why that is. I mean, being the only girl in the family, perhaps that, that you have more of a intense desire to understand family and than the boys do somehow. So yes, I think I, I definitely it was me who who um who took it upon myself. It's interesting you say that because just broadening the canvas slightly, if I can, you know, I, I was for example just the other day chairing an event of um short films by second generation filmmakers, and it's quite remarkable. And in fact, it was the second of a uh, in a uh, <clears throat> kind of pair of events, and um, they were all women. It was not my intention at all, but this question of gender. It does seem to me, I absolutely agree. Yes, with you. it's it terribly no common. Hard and fast explanation for it, and people yeah. might contest it, but it does seem to me it is the women in the next generations who are the ones who really want to find out more and to do something with that knowledge. I think, I, I completely agree with you, Monica. I think that's that's exactly <coughs> true. And, and I think it's perhaps there's something, yeah, deeply important to women to understand these things, you know, and, and, and where you come from. I, I, yes, I completely agree. You know, however, however painful, in, indeed. However painful. <laughs> um, I but also, also, there was joy in it. I mean, there was a great deal of of, of um, enjoyment in 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 getting to know my uncle and aunt, um, 
who were both delightful and and I think it was important for them too it was they because they had missed my mother all those years and um you know so it was lovely to make contact with them and and to forge a relationship with them it, it was about sort of putting together relationships that should have been there mm. but but weren't for all mm. of the reasons that I've outlined so so yeah as well as pain there was there's been a lot of um yeah a lot of joy in it mm. yes uh, you said quite understandably that you wanted to in a sense simplify the story because you didn't want to confuse by introducing too many protagonists <coughs> oh I do apologize I've got <laughs> a frog in my throat I can't get rid of um but one person you haven't mentioned which does actually um bring in the points at which your you know your family story does not dovetail exactly but you know which has more direct sort of insider outsider connections in the sense that my you know my project has, has been engaging with it is Fania Fenelon and I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit yes. more about that experience. Yes that's interesting yes. you know that my dad I mean like I said my 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 family on the Jewish side were miraculously preserved from the Holocaust mm -hmm. and, and um terribly fortunate um but every now and again my father would talk a little bit about his cousin who was Fanny Fenelon I don't know whether this audience everyone knows who she was I suspect not. Um, why don't you just tell us briefly yeah but just happened. to appreciate yes she was um so she was a cousin on on the Hyman side um and she um and joined the French resistance and ended up in Auschwitz um she survived her experience because she joined the orchestra um and she wrote them i don't know if anyone's read it but the most extraordinary book called playing for time and then a film was made of it uh starring vanessa redgrave um and i i, I believe fania was didn't approve of that and she wanted to be played by liza minnelli <laughs> who might have been a more suitable bit of casting um but I do remember when my dad talked about her, he, you know, he got a sort of far away look in his eyes if, you know, that the experience of the Holocaust was being channeled through him, through his cousin. Um, but yes, I, I was always aware of her. Mm. I think it's also a reminder, isn't it, that, you know, even with Jewish families who came to this country as immigrants as part of a much earlier turn of the century, you know, sort of phenomenon of Jews fleeing from Eastern Europe and Russia, you know, from the pogroms of the Tsarist regime, that actually the Holocaust impinges in its own way, perhaps in a more it minor does. key. I think but it's, it's really, still it's still there, isn't it? It's still there. Yeah, I think it still yeah. is there. And and um you're living, I think when you're living in exile, you're still feeling, you know, the its effects on you. And and I agree, I think it it's never too far away. And I think my Jew, my dad's Jewish roots were were never too far away either, even though he, um, you know, he, he, he didn't really talk about his Jewishness at all. And, and he was fully um, secularized. He, I, you know, I felt, I felt it scratched the surface and there was a religious man there. <laughs> you know, you could understand that he had be, he was the grandson of a rabbi. Um, and, and as I said before, particularly as he was dying, I, I felt, you know, suddenly that, that was something very important to him, yes. I'm wondering which direction, there are many directions I'd like to take. This yes, sorry. Also, I no, 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 no. And I also don't want to stop other people chipping in, so please, please do put a hand up or, or type in uh, to the chat. But um, no, I was, I'm sort of mesmerised, but I'm that beautiful, that portrait of Fanny by Emmanuel Levy is so haunting, isn't it? Isn't it so lovely? Sad. And, and, and yeah, and telling the story of her um, suicide with that mm, up on the screen. Mm. But he's interesting because he was a Manchester-based um, Jewish yes. artist from a kind of Anglo, you know, the earlier, again, the earlier immigrant um, background. But I know him best for a, a work which is actually kind of pertinent to what we've just been saying. And I don't know if you know it at all. It's actually called, um, I think it's just called Crucifixion. It was done in the early 1940s. And what it shows is a Jew complete with talit, you know, prayer shawl, to fill in the whole works and all, the sort of trappings of an Orthodox Jew on the mm. cross. 
So this idea of a Jewish Jesus, you know, on the cross as an emblem of Jewish suffering in the Holocaust is something that I personally am very interested in. And that's how I sort of, you know, came to Emmanuel Luthi. But isn't that interesting? I mean, apropos what we were just saying. Yes. Yes. Oh, absolutely fascinating. Yes. Yes. No, I, I don't know it. But it's, it out. it's um, very interesting. It belongs to the Benary Gallery here in here in London. Yes. Um, yeah, really interesting. Uh, no, I, mean, I don't know. Um, I don't know much about his other work, but I, I've just always had that portrait. Mm. This is totally different. That's partly why I found it. Right. Yeah, yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Um, talking about other painters that you mentioned, um, Peter Perry is an interesting one. I don't know. You probably don't know much more about the. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm afraid to say that I'm, I don't have much depth of knowledge about all of them. Um, just simply to know that, that it was just this interesting idea that. Um, there they were, all were in Rosemary's house and, um, uh, you know, Rosemary has been amused, I think, by, by these kind of intense communists and, and um, yeah, so, but, but I don't know very much uh, background about any of them, no. I was intrigued by that because Peter Perry is somebody, again, I'm rather interested in. And in fact, I've been in touch with his grandson, who, believe it or not, is also called Peter Perry. And I need to reconnect oh. with him in the hope of him giving a talk about uh, his grandfather. And if I may, perhaps I'll put you in touch with each other because, you know, this is probably an aspect of his grandfather's life he knows less about. Yes. But yeah, very interesting. He was, I mean, Perry, for the record, he was a <clears throat> Hungarian Jew who was an ardent communist, as you made yes. quite clear, and very socially minded public sculpture. And in fact, his sculpture is still to be seen you know around London and elsewhere so an interesting figure um, yes. indeed indeed I'm also intrigued I mean this phenomenon I don't put it sort of too crudely but you know of the kind of the the, the, the Jewish man in fact it is obvious now, now I think about it it tends to be who actually ends up marrying a woman from a very high sort of elevated, elevated but, you know, sort of a, de or a deeply aristocratic <coughs> British background and I just wondered um you know with the Hampstead connections for example <coughs> whether oh I'm sorry this is really <coughs> much worse than usual yeah no it's quite a common it's quite a common pattern because I mean Karl Marx did mm -hmm. you have to remember oh, right I hadn't thought of that but I was actually thinking more of a kind of local figures closer to our own time but there were the Ullmans of course and I think you do you mention Fred Ullman in your in your yes. script, I think you do, because Fred Ullman was a, a German Jewish lawyer turned artist, lived at number 47, down to Hill. I remember and him well. He, I remember him well, shaking his yep, stick. Yep, yep. <laughs> a local character. Speaking in, in a strong German accent and um, having so, long conversations with my dad about everything. OK, subject. interesting, interesting, because he married somebody called Diana, um, well, Di she became Diana Ullman, but she was Diana Croft from a very, very kind of, um, long one of the oldest you know most aristocratic families in the land the croft family croft castle in herefordshire i visited recently it's very different to yes you? and her daughter uh, caroline was a great friend she just died she just mother, died yeah just very yeah. recently um but but it, it was actually oh, the, i didn't it, know that Yes, I, I was told recently. But uh, no, the interesting thing there is, and it's also the same with Erno Goldfinger, another Hampstead character. And again, I wonder whether your parents would have known him. He was a, a Hungarian um, Jewish architect. I don't architect. think they did know him, but um, but no, it is one of the questions I ask in my book, that why it's such a common pattern that these um, kind of um, Marxist, radical Marxist figures do end up marrying um, Yes, grand women. <laughs> There's certainly plenty of that in my family. Yeah, yeah, no, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, I think in the woman's case, I mean, she was very, she was left leaning in her politics and she did a great deal to help, as indeed did Fred. Refugees, they set up, or they were instrumental in setting up something called the Artists' Refugee Committee in the 1930s, which you may or may not know about. So actually, that whole constellation of really interesting characters in Downshire Hill is absolutely fascinating. I mean, there was Roland Penrose and Lee Miller sort of across the road from you guys, I think. Yes, and the Medawars. The you know? <coughs> Medawars. And also, did you know, or uh, do you recall that if your parents had nothing to do with um, Margaret Gardner and J.D. I remember Bernard. the name. Yes, I do remember the name being talked about. Um, I can't mm -hmm. remember. I don't think she can have been a very close friend because mm -hmm. I can't remember her, but I do remember her being talked about, yes. She was a partly European Jewish extraction herself, but she was a patron of the arts rather than artist and one of Barbara Hepworth's best friends. And of course, Barbara Hepworth lived not that far away, wrote the first book about her and Bernal, her partner. And, yeah. um, um, 
actually uh, was again an ardent communist as well as being a microcrystallographer, I think. So kind of really extraordinary bunch of people just within a very short, you know, sort of small area of Hampstead. Quite fascinating. Yeah, well, well, I mean, it just, get, yes. I mean, Hampstead is just the most extraordinary place as I think you could, I, mean, I, I hope that the map I showed sort of illustrates this and, and just the tiny little area it's crammed with so many extraordinary people. Absolutely, it might be worth mentioning on that um, <coughs> point that there's a fascinating display in the former garage of the Isocon building in Lawn Road, which again is not far away from Downshire Hill, which tells the story of Hampstead in the 1930s in ways that will intersect, you know, with, with your story to some to some extent. Um, well worth visiting. It's open to the public at the weekends. Ah, yes, the yes, Isocon yes. building. Absolutely. No, I know Lawn Road. My brother lived there for a while. Oh, so. well, there you are. So yes, yes. <laughs> it was the first uh, reinforced concrete modernist apartment block in the yes. city, I do believe, 1930. Um, I'm looking at the time. Last chance for anybody else to to intervene if they would like to. If not, perhaps I can just I'm just looking at the chat. I pick up on the mention of the Bernals because Martin Bernal, their son, actually went to Dartington College, and I wonder whether we might conclude by you just saying a little bit more about your father's relationship to Dartington, which obviously played quite an important part in in his life. Yes. No. No. The the the, um, the Dartington connection was an important and interesting one. Um, I think my dad, basically, Dartington became incredibly important to him. It, it sort of laid the foundation of, um, the, well, the way he put it, the, perhaps the best way of talking about this is that, that um, my brother made uh, some tapes of my dad speaking right at the end of his life. Mm -hmm. And, um, they're very poignant um, and the thing he talks about above all others is Dartington. So he's, my brother was supposed to be taping him talking about his life, but he, all he talks about mm. is Dartington Hall. And it, so it obviously was hugely important to him. And I think it, he said things like, we thought the arts belonged to us. And, and you know, they had the most extraordinary them um, and I think it almost sort of ruins you for anything else because you you or for sort of ordinary life as you come across such extraordinary people and you are taught as the Bauhaus and by you know it was just he was steeped in the place and 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 it stayed with him his whole life mm -hmm. yeah it was terribly important to him um, so yes, it was, it was, he was there at a remarkable time, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, he, he left to go to Canada during the war and I think that he missed the place terribly. Um, now, I'm particularly interested again, I mustn't keep everybody too long, but Dartington Hall is a place of refuge for the 1930s refugees, often children, but some of them mm. teachers at schools, really rich terrain, which is only beginning to be kind of looked at carefully. And I'm in contact, I think I mentioned to Fanny before we started properly, yeah. with, the, uh, with the current artistic director at Dartington, who feels it's a very topical subject that actually should be given more exposure. So we're working towards an event probably for autumn of next year, precisely on that topic. So I shall... That's very interesting, yeah, Monica, because really I often do wonder why why they chose to send him, why, why his parents chose to send him there. And um, so that that's shed some light on 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 it yeah it was liberal it was eccentric it was a safe very interesting. From, yeah no, absolutely really really yeah. fascinating perhaps we should end by me asking you a question that Lorna has put in the chat which you <clears throat> may or may not have noticed um Fanny a obvious question perhaps is there more to come out more relevant <laughs> and indeed on, on the back that's of that, it <laughs> that's definitely it it stands as a it might no be more. Different, but you never know and perhaps we can just end by uh, me asking you i'm sure everybody's also wondering you know you've written this this very polished and, and engaging um manuscript what are what are the plans to publish it uh, you are yes a, well um currently looking for a publisher um and as i said to you um to the beginning of the talk I mean, I, at the very beginning, I have had some publisher interest, um, which, which started me off in the first place. But um, but yeah, no, I'm 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 currently still still looking for a suitable publisher. 
So if anybody so, in the audience has any suggestions, or <laughs> <laughs> please speak out. Um, and the other question I must ask, because we're constantly talking about women whose ambitions have been suppressed or sidetracked mm. because of their male partners or, or relationships. What about your mother's lovely work? I and mean, I take it that the illustrations mm. are rather tantalizingly small in the manuscript that you sent me are indeed all of her own work and you've shown some of them she's a very sensitive accomplished artist mm, she has, was. Her work, has her work ever been shown are there plans to show it no well i mean that's that, that's also a really interesting question because um i don't know if you remember but in my text i um reproduce a letter from her art school boyfriend who was a potter called seth mm -hmm. Cardew, mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful letter and it and it talks about how um he thinks she was really an extraordinary artist. Um, and he, I think he described it as having a wide window of awareness on anything she came across. Um, and he wrote a letter to my uncle saying, could I make sure that I gathered together all of her work? Um, and he would love to see an exhibition of it. Um, and he sadly died now, but um, unfortunately, a lot of the things she painted in the dark house where Rosemary had her her set up with John, have got lost. I, th I think I think when Rosemary said, "Right, that's it. That's the end of my life here." Everything she just made a huge bonfire or got rid of stuff, and and sadly, I think quite a lot of her work was lost. Um, but such as I have, um, it would be lovely to find a way of um, exhibiting it. You might like to contact Berg House, which, as some of you may know, is you know it's the self style museum of yes. art, and they have actually quite a nice exhibition space. And uh, yeah, it's a good idea. And and, and I would be very delighted as well that that um, to be able to include a lot of her work in my book. Mm, absolutely, good. as a way of of bringing it to a wider audience. Absolutely. Well, good good luck with that, and keep thank you. Keep me posted. Very good. Uh, so I think it's probably time to draw things to an end. Last chance. No, you've got some nice comments coming in. Um, any questions? <laughs> any questions? Well, you had the one question, but mostly complimentary responses to what we've been hearing. Okay, just lastly then- Thank you, and I'm sorry about the technical problems. It happens, yeah. it happens, yeah. it happens. Um, just to say that it has been recorded, sort of, yes, blips and all, and the recording will be uploaded within a week or so onto the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel, which I haven't yet mentioned, but that's now serving as really quite a rich repository of, uh, events on all manner of subjects, all with this kind of insider outsider, you know, sort of uh, tension, creative tension, somehow linking them. Um, so yes, easily found, I think, on, on Google. And uh, I think there were those who didn't, in fact, who signed up, but didn't actually attend. So I will make sure that uh, they also know that it will be recorded. And thank you very, very much, Fanny. It's been absolutely wonderful listening to you. Thank you. I hope you can keep in touch. And thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. All, all the best and good night. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.